Welcome to Revenge of the Drive-In, the podcast brought to you from the Grandma Sophia's Podcast Network. Here we discuss two movies randomly selected from a list of over 2,000. In this week's case, we have 1964's The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb from Hammer Films, as well as Puppet Master 2 from Full Moon Entertainment. I am your host, Patrick, and I am joined by... Jim. Hello, everybody. Hello, Patrick. How are you? I'm I'm good, Jim. How are you? Oh, you know, living life, loving it. I guess without further ado, we'll hop right into our lovely next Hammer horror film, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, as you rightly said. The second in the Hammer Mummy series. Although yeah. Although there's no real continuity. When did the last one come out? In like the mid-50s? Is, is that the one that we watched? The, the first one was 59. This one's 64. No Peter Cushing, no Christopher Lee. But still an interesting movie. I'd never seen it before, much like with Puppet Master 2, but I was pleasantly surprised. And if I have to be honest, my favorite part of this movie <laughs> was at the beginning. Because we begin the in black Egypt. Face. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, it, it's in both movies. It's it's briefer in Puppet Master 2. <laughs> and those are actually Charles Band's kids in, no. in the Cairo scene. Yeah. No. But with this movie, we get our blackface at the beginning of Egypt, or at the beginning yeah. of Egypt, at the beginning of the movie. It we... hits you hard. Yeah. It hits you hard in <laughs> the opening. Does. Warning. Warning. of the mummy's tomb. We begin in Egypt in uh, 1900 exact, where there are old white imperialists, men of Middle Eastern descent, and white men with lots of shoe polish on their faces. White men of Middle Eastern descent. Yes, yeah. yes, you're right, yes. <laughs> but we open with an old man who's a professor named Eugene Dubois. He's bound in the middle of the Egyptian desert and surrounded by men, which uh, is the beginning of my kind of movie, if you know what I mean. One of these men comes forward, rifles through his belongings, before stabbing him in the stomach and cutting off one of his hands. Dubois' daughter, Annette, is at camp with John Bray, an Egyptologist. They're waiting for Annette's father's return. Now, of course, he does return, but dead on a stretcher, having been found by Sir Giles, I believe is his name. And he's like the lead archaeologist stroke Egyptologist of this dig. I think it's four total archaeologists, then plus Annette who's not an she's not professionally an Egyptologist but she essentially has the same knowledge that everybody else has I guess yeah and and I think they explain later that yeah we get the backstory on her later yeah which again she's not super important but no yeah, she well exists. you know what I mean most of the characters here aren't super important if I may say there's because John Bray is I guess kind of our protagonist and he is just a wet blanket he's just so boring <laughs> he is yeah this movie is really strange because for it's it's about an hour and 20 minutes long i think and for the first 50 minutes of this movie we're focused on interpersonal conflicts and stuff like that and 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 more how the characters are reacting to each other on screen and oh yeah it takes a very long time for there to be any mummy action yeah the first time we see the mummy out of the sarcophagus moving around is about 52 minutes into the movie yeah when he kills my favorite character oh he's a great character the american um huckster businessman guy played by some character actor from the time who i recognize from a twilight zone episode he's in uh, the most unusual camera that's i think the only thing i've seen him in other than this but he's just a lot of fun Every British movie from this period deserves that guy, Fred Clark, I think is his name, okay. playing like a sleazy American businessman. He really does something with that role. He's really fantastic. And speaking of him, his character's name is, I think it's Alexander King. Yeah. Like you said, he's he's like a sleazy businessman. He's It's really neat how they set up this movie because this is kind of like from that period in actual time where you had wealthy British and American people financing these trips to Egypt for collecting mummies, essentially. And, and French, them back. too. Yes, and they, French. They do tie the French into this. The French were innocent in the first mummy movie. So were the Americans, I guess. It was only British people, but 
this is more historically accurate, I suppose. <laughs> it is. Also, it's uh, very historically accurate in the way that John smacks one of the Egyptian workers after he drops the body of uh, Annette's, <laughs> of Annette's father. He goes, why did you do that? And he just smacks him. But yeah, so this Alexander King character, he's financed this expedition to Egypt to uncover this mummy of Ra. He has a full name. It's like Ra Antef or something, but everybody just calls him Ra. Yeah, because it's confusing because Ra is a god. He's the sun god, so that's mm-hmm. kind of a little annoying. Yeah, I don't think this movie was made uh, with like much Egyptian history and uh, and culture no, in mind. No, no, no mummy movie is. I mean, no. <laughs> you know, but... Well, except for maybe, except for maybe the nineteen ninety nine Brendan Fraser mummy movie. Oh come on! So when the body comes back to camp, it's being escorted by Sir Giles and Hash Hashmi, and he's kind of like the head of Egyptian antiquities. And he's very against these guys coming in and removing the mummy of uh, Ra and all of the grave goods mm-hmm. and stuff. And he's trying to keep it in Egypt. And one of the reasons is because of this supposed curse. And also, curse is, we, we know, should note that he's played by the same actor that was Mehmet Bey in the 1959 mummy. Oh, so, was he really? Yeah. So we're kind of conditioned, if you've seen that movie, like, apparently you're not because you didn't recognize him, but you're kind of conditioned <laughs> to assume he's a bad guy. And I actually think oh, that really works realize. to the movie's favor. Well, you know what his last name is in this movie? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same Bay. thing. It's Bay, yeah. yeah. Perhaps well, a relative. I, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's uh, George Pastel, this actor from Cyprus. I looked him up last time. So he's here. He's explaining the curse. Or he's saying, hey, don't take the mummy, you know, the curse. And everybody's kind of scoffing at this curse. And obviously the curse is whoever's present at the opening of the tomb will die. Much like what happened in real life with King Tut. Oh, by the way, the sarcophagus in this movie is very, very King Tut. Just overall, they were definitely inspired by that in terms of the design. We're shown the the doors of the tomb with the rope around it and the seal. Yeah. And that's the exact same handle type and position that the rope was tied in with the seal hanging down as when they found King Tut's tomb in like in like nineteen nineteen. Okay. Or I I wouldn't have known that. The door does just look like a kitchen cabinet, though, a little bit. It does. It does. So, so they could have so dressed it up a, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So John's reprimanding all these people and this Egyptian antiquities minister fellow, Hashmi, because it's obvious that the Egyptian government doesn't want them to take the mummy. Gee, why wouldn't they want that? Well, exactly, right? Why wouldn't they want their history gone? Well, then enter Alexander King. So again, this wealthy American businessman. Also, uh, we, we should probably say that John Bray, the English guy who's kind of our protagonist, um, is engaged to Annette. Yes. It's the most lackluster romance I've seen in it is. film history just They about. spend a, a bit of time kissing, and that's about it. There's a, roughly 25 seconds in which there's a love triangle in the movie, and then it just moves on where <laughs> she's with someone else, and we just didn't really see how that happened. <laughs> yeah, that's, exa- <laughs> that's exactly it, yeah. So King comes in and says, great, we've got this mummy and everything, we're, we're loading it onto a ship, and I'm going to parade it around England and America. And Sir Giles, who's the head of this expedition, says, no, 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 it's going to go to a museum. Alexander King says, no, screw you, Giles, we're going to be making a hell of a lot of money doing this. He quotes, I don't know if it's, uh, yeah, he quotes P.T. Barnum at one point, it's clear what kind of character he is. He is Carl Denham from King Kong, he's just that guy out there trying to make a profit, exploit whatever he yeah. can. No interest in science. And also, I want to point out, I think this scene has a monkey in it, and that's the coolest monkey I've ever seen in a movie. I don't I don't remember it. Oh, okay, he was eating dates on the table, much like Indiana Jones. Well, that monkey died. <laughs> Intelligent species, my ass. <laughs> also part of this conversation is Hashmi. And he's upset because his cultural history is going to be paraded around the world for a fee. And Sir Giles is upset enough that he steps down. He says, I'm not I'm not the head of this expedition anymore. I, you can take over, and I'm going to give the reins to John Bray. There's a line at one point where he, he refers to himself as, like, an Egyptologist who can't enter Egypt or something. Does he get, like, banned from the country? Yeah, so, that, so as they're on the ship, when we next see yeah. everybody, they're on the ship heading back to London. And we see Giles, who's, like, almost pissed drunk. He's, like, stumbling around on the boat. Oh, yeah, he's drunk for almost the rest of the movie, basically. It's wonderful. 
and him being banned from Egypt is why. And John says, Hashmi reported to the government, and the government has then since banned an Egyptologist from ever working in Egypt again. Which is a little weird that the Egyptian government is able to take those steps, and yet they can't prevent the mummy from being taken out of the country. You'd think if they can do yeah, one, they can do the other, but whatever. So everything gets loaded on this ship, including Sir Including Giles, Giles. yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Then he kind of walks out of frame, and then we hear him scream. So John runs into his quarters, he, he sees him laying on the ground, and we see a creepy-looking guy with a knife kind of sneak out of the room. Mm -hmm. And then this guy just starts walloping the absolute ever-loving shit out of this knife-wielding guy. <laughs> He's knocking him around so hard Wait, who, that who is this? Wait, who is this that fights him? Is it uh, Bray? Adam. Oh, it's, it's Adam. Adam, okay. This fellow who we don't know the name of yet, who's Adam. No. <laughs> He's beating the crap out of this guy so hard that he knocks him over the railing of the ship and into the ocean. Wonderful stuff. <laughs> it's like it's actually really good. He, now, if he if you like want a more exciting version of this scene, you could watch the Brendan Fraser 1999 Mummy, where there's like a big shootout on the ship and people are on fire and everything. But this this delivers the goods for what it is, I think. Absolutely, and it it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Which yeah, is yeah, weird. that that's why it's enjoyable as much as anything is that it's just very random and it's very different from everything else in the movie. It's a great introduction to a character, and this is when we start to see that love triangle take shape. Because when John finally, it's also comes... where we where we end seeing yeah. it take shape because it's. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. We see it briefly and then it's gone. But when John comes to, he sees Annette and Adam hanging out, having a few drinks together. So let's talk about Adam. He's a mysterious character. He's not an Egyptologist, but he seems to carry a lot of knowledge about Egypt and even even an older age of Egypt than Bray does, which is weird and yeah. they don't really believe him. But he's in particular drawn to a medallion that... Annette has. Well, and we don't even know she has this. We don't know anything about this medallion yet. Right. We learn about it in, in the five seconds where there's a love triangle. Well, exactly. Yeah. So Adam invites Annette and John back to his place in London. John is obviously very wary of this attractive, dashing man who beat the shit out of somebody on a boat. He also realizes that Adam is very interested in Egypt, Egyptology. Mm -hmm. Annette invites Adam to this exhibition where they can kind of like peruse the objects before they go up. And we get this whole backstory about the mummy. And it, it, the long and short of it is this guy Ra is the old, is, is the eldest son of like King Ramses the seventh or whatever. I think eighth, but yes. One of the Ramses is. The one who married a bunch of women. Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> His younger brother named is it B or is it Bay? God, I don't remember the younger brother's name. I don't remember the younger brother coming up at this point. I thought he just comes up. No, he, he comes up at this point because it's the story. So okay. the brother's name is spelled B-E, so we'll just call him B. B doesn't like Ra because Ra's more popular, Ramses loves him more. So he starts spreading rumors that like he's like an occultist or something in this in ancient Egypt. And the, the public... get him canceled. Exactly, exactly. So the public believe him, and Ra, bowing to public pressure, expels him from Egypt. He's like, get out of here, and don't ever come back, unfortunately. So he goes wandering the Sahara, and he meets this nomadic tribe who are actual kind of like magician occultist people that have this medallion that's supposed to bring people back from the dead. Ra quickly becomes their king, and he's given this medallion. And shortly after he's given this medallion... B sends a bunch of people to kill Ra and all the priests and all the people, and that's exactly what he does. And he also cuts off the left hand of Ra and brings it back as proof that he's dead. Which is the second hand severing we've seen because uh, the French dude in the opening, yes, Annette finds her dad's hand. In, in, in his bed or her bed? Yeah, someone's bed in the tent. This is the second of three hand severings in this in this <laughs> film, believe it or not. The third one is is like incredible. The it's third one's the best one. Dory for um, nineteen sixty four. So after Annette 
tells this story to Adam, he seems to be really agitated. And uh, he's like, well, where's the medallion? And she goes, well, people don't know. He goes, well, did you find it <laughs> in the tomb? She goes, well, we didn't find anything. He goes, oh, it must be there. Well, it can't be a true story if you didn't find the medallion. And then suddenly John interrupts and says, hey, the sarcophagus is up. Do you want to come and see the mummy? And they all agree and they go. And King pries open the, the sarcophagus and they see the mummy of Ra in there missing a hand classic classic mummy look far more far different from the christopher lee mummy yes um more the bandage mummy more classic when you actually see him moving i think it's maybe a little bit better than christopher lee but there's still something that seems kind of off and it's not just the hand the noise that the mummy makes that hollow breathing noise is absolutely oh, yeah. terrifying. It, it's it's chilling. Well, it's such a great effect. It's a bit strong, but okay. How dare you? I was terrified. Oh, no, I mean, I mean, he breathes. <laughs> yeah, but it's like a hollow. It, it's like, I don't know. It sounds really cool, really creepy. Was this the inspiration for Darth Vader? Wouldn't that be so funny? <laughs> George, This is like George Lucas's favorite movie. George Lucas was a fan of the Hammer horror films, hence Peter Cushing Hence, David Prowse, the guy who plays Darth Vader in physical form, you know, James Earl Jones does the voice. He is the monster in one of the Peter Cushing Frankenstein movies. I think it's the last one, which is oh. the worst one. Oh. So, <laughs> and then also Christopher Lee eventually as Count Dooku. That's way later. But George Lucas was a fan of these films. I wouldn't be shocked to learn that he's taken that, you know, the breathing detail from there. But it's also just, it's breathing you know, that's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's well, like, it's just, listen, yeah. audience, audience, go search out this movie, which, by the way, totally free on YouTube in its entirety, if you can't find it anywhere else, and listen to the breathing. It's great, but you got to skip to, like, the last 30-ish minutes of the movie. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't do <laughs> shit for, for the longest time, yeah. Uh, so everybody goes back to Adam's house, and this is where John finds a medallion in Annette's purse that was given to her by her father. So now we, the audience, know that it is, in fact, the medallion that we saw in this flashback. And Adam knows it's the medallion, too. Exactly. And he translates it or something. Or I don't know if he necessarily translates it, but again, he says it's from the early an older kingdom. period than, yeah, the, than... than what Adam knows, and so Adam doesn't really... No, he John. is Adam. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. John. It's. I yeah, know, there's so John. many names floating around. Don't even worry about it. No, you know what it is? It's Wikipedia lists Adam first, and John kind of is our protagonist, so that's what's throwing me off. So like you said, Adam all, like immediately knows what it is. John takes it, and he wants to go get the help of drunk Sir Giles to see if they can figure out what this is. Sir Giles, poor Sir Giles, is so drunk... That he's not also, gonna... it's it's sometime around this time that Annette apparently breaks up with him. Yeah, it's and all very... starts dating Adam. I guess it just kind of happens. We don't really see. Yeah, it. She, she gets she gets a kiss on the shoulder, and she's like, "Well, yeah. fuck this, John guy. I'm going with Adam, who beat the crap yeah, out of cause... a guy on a boat and is kissing me on the shoulder now." Because when they go to the the unveiling, the official unveiling, which is far from a packed house, by the way. I thought... <laughs> I thought yeah. <laughs> I thought this Alexander King guy knew what he was doing, but yeah, apparently not. Yeah, and then uh, was, she's sitting with Adam at that point. Well, and that and that kind of leads in nicely to what I'm about to say because John is at Giles's place and Sir Giles goes to bed because he's drunk and knocking over brandy glasses. And while he's doing that, somebody sneaks into Sir Giles's house and knocks out John and steals the medallion. So. John is now somewhere recovering, but Sir Giles, Hashmi, Annette, and Adam all show up to King's grand opening of his exhibition. And mm -hmm. it, it's very theatrical, and really, I, I think it's done really well. Yeah, it is. And this is where we see more, like, well, it, it starts with the projector presentation with the photos, and there's one moment where he tries to make a joke. Yeah. And the laughter goes on for about 10 seconds too long or something, which is just strange because <laughs> it yeah. wasn't very funny. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. And you also you, you see the production that goes into this kind of thing. And then when they open the sarcophagus, it is a full Geraldo. <laughs> uh, what's it, Al Capone's uh, vault, bank vault thing. There's no mummy yes, there. Exactly. And yeah. this is why it was good that, well, one. It shows like what kind of a lying piece of shit Alexander King is because he makes a big deal about this is the first time it's ever been open. We already saw it open. 
Yeah. But I, I think it was neat that we saw it open because one, it shows that this guy's just lying. He'll do anything to make some money. But also like it's it establishes, OK, there is a mummy and now there isn't one. You know, where where the hell did he go? Yeah. And with, with that question in mind, all of the guests and by all, I mean, like five guests leave and the rest of the main characters. Well, five of 12. I mean, there's yeah. really not many there. It's, it, this is not a big this is not a West End um big venue really the main characters stay and they're being questioned by the police and whatever and then they all kind of go their separate ways and go home except for john who shows up late after the the exhibition and who then makes his way to hashmi's rented room to hopefully find the medallion or proof that he has something to do with the missing mummy yeah he he thinks it's hashmi because racism i guess i don't yeah, know and because then, he's egyptian alexander king also thinks it might be hashmi because hashmi kind of kind because of threatened him before the show well yeah. no that i mean he has more reason to <laughs> suspect him than bray does yeah well i mean hashmi was trying to buy the mummy and all the grave goods back at one hundred twenty thousand pounds before the show yeah as he as he points out he didn't threaten him he just told him what would happen mm -hmm. if he went through with everything but speaking of king though this leads to one of the best scenes in the movie. King leaves. He's walking down this dark, super foggy, dingy alleyway, and he's approached by like, this prostitute. And here he gets like some kind of a moral redemption, though I don't think he really needed it. But you know, the prostitute says, "What can I do for you? You know, can you you know you want to bang?" And he goes, oh, "I'll tell you what you can do for me. Have a good night's sleep," and gives her like a shilling or whatever. And she goes, mm -hmm. "Oh, thank you, sir. You're so kind." And as he's kind of like smiling to himself, he's walking away, the mummy appears at the top of these dirty, dark, damp <laughs> stairs under this awesome like brick barrel vaulted staircase. You know, like it just looks so cool. And then the mummy slowly steps into the light and you can see this, this all bandaged up face and these little slits with eyes. And he just picks oh, I, up. I will say they got the eyes right in this movie. That was one thing yeah, that I hated about the Christopher Lee mummy. You could see way too much of his eyes. This time, it's much better. Well, the mummy just kind of picks up King and th like chucks him down the stairs. And he hits every single step on the way down and then like rolls into the Thames. Yeah. Yeah, it's just such a cool atmospheric scene. I just love it. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's a great entrance for our monster. It takes forever to get to the actual monster doing anything, but this is a good introduction for sure. You, Red Clock, beware. Let gold not be your god. Well, then another great scene is when Sir Giles is killed shortly after. He's drunk again, and he finds like a, like an etching or like a rubbing that I assume uh, John had made of the medallion, and he's like trying to translate it. And then the mummy busts in through like this set of French doors and just explodes the doors apart. And Giles reaches into his desk and picks out like a little revolver, starts shooting at the mummy, but the mummy comes up and like, chokes him to death. And then, oh no, I think he bludgeons him right with something on the desk. Yeah, he hits him with he hits him over the head with like a cat, like paperweight. It's like yeah. an Egyptian cat paperweight. I'm sure it's supposed to be like an Egyptian relic, but it just looks like a paperweight. It <laughs> it does it does unfortunately, but it's it's like it's still a super cool scene. Well, so so then Hashmi and John start working together. Yeah, be because they both realize that they're not the bad guys. <laughs> right, but but their like agreement, it's kind of strange, comes off screen. It happens, I think, when we're seeing either King or Giles get killed. Giles. And, but yeah, they start working together. They start telling the cops what's up, and they figure someone brought the mummy back, and the mummy is going to kill everyone who was specifically involved in opening the tomb. Yes. Yeah. Even though was are we saying Alexander King was specifically involved? I guess I guess he financed it, but like he didn't. The mummy knows how modern corporations work. <laughs> the mummy has a strong grasp of capitalism. So while all that's going on that you just described, the mummy staggers its way over to Adam's house, where Annette comes up from the or she comes out from her room at the top of the stairs, and there's Adam being strangled. And as soon as the mummy sees Annette, it starts moving for her at the top of the stairs. Adam calls out to it. He, like, recites some verse in Egyptian. And the mummy stops and looks at him and then continues up the stairs to towards Annette. But she passes out from fear. And <laughs> instead of killing her, the mummy just, like, strokes her hand and then walks down the stairs and backhands the absolute ever-loving shit out of Adam. 
<laughs> who knocks him halfway across the room, and then the mummy stumbles away. And then, I think the next big scene to happen is Hashmi and John attempt to capture the mummy at Sir Giles's house with the help of like police officers and a giant net that they're going to drop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it totally rips apart this net that they've trapped it in. Well, it only does that after Hashmi is telling it to kill him. Because he's... Yeah. He is like... Because they, they... You know, I I don't know if this would actually work, but it seems to be working that they have this mummy, you know, held captive. But then Hashmi's like, no, no, no. Kill me because I've allied with the pillagers or something. Like, take my... You know, I deserve to die or something. It kind of comes out of nowhere. I think he was kind of like trying to apologize for his ancestors' actions. I thought he was apologizing for his current actions. No, I don't think he has done anything. I think he was just trying to get the mummy back to Egypt. And I think he was like, oh my god, I didn't believe that this mummy was real. I didn't believe that Ra was a good person through all these stories that have been handed down through many generations. And I apologize well, for he? myself and my ancestors. He's out and... there killing people. Is he a good person? I don't, I don't... Is he killing people? Oh, sorry. Oh, rot. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm pretty sure we just talked like, about <laughs> several scenes. Yeah, no, he's the mummy's not a good person. Then the mummy curb stomps him, which is amazing. I mean, you don't really, you don't see anything, but the implication is, is very, very violent for the time period. I wish we could have seen a head explosion. Oh, yeah, that would have been so out of place <laughs> in, the, in this 1964 very That would have been awesome, though. That would have been, like, one of the top head explosions that we would have seen on this It would have been, yeah, because uh, in Halloween 2018, Michael Myers curb stomps the uh, crazy psychologist guy. And that's yes, a, it yeah. Looks, like, it splatters his head like a cake. <laughs> Gross. So while all that's going on, Annette regains consciousness, and she's interested in the fact that the mummy attacked Adam. And she's like, why would it attack Adam? He wasn't there at the opening of the tomb, so, you know, why? Well, in trying to explain this, Adam lures Annette into the basement of his house, where he explains that he is, in fact, B, Roz. Yeah, he's he's got his own national treasure vault. (laughs) Yeah, with like 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 an Egyptian crown. And she's like, oh, these are all so well-preserved. And he's like, well, that's because they're... Are they modern? Did he make these? I don't understand. No, this, they're but... all his. Like he's he's immortal. Yeah, but how did he preserve them, them for fifteen hundred years? More than fifteen hundred years. But yeah, I mean, I, I just I don't really understand it. Doesn't matter all that much. I mean, I must have missed the part where, or when he became immortal, or or when we learned how he became immortal. But it was something to do with the medallion that his brothers yes. wearing. Yeah, it, a lot of this is a little unclear to me, I think, because his whole thing is he wants to be mortal again, because mm-hmm. he's been cursed with thousands of years of immortality, he's witnessed wars, famines, all this stuff, and then so he he wants to, like, make it right by his brother, but I'm just confused, like, does his brother want to kill him? Because it, it looked like he did in that other scene, but now I don't well, think see, the... Well, see, thought, I thought he was Because the trying... brother's the mummy, if, you know, um, so I, yeah, I don't know. Well, I thought he was trying to get the medallion to make Annette immortal. Because at one point near the end, he says, now we can be together. Yeah, but I think he's talking afterlife because he wants to be mortal. Well, either way, it's confusing. But it, we get this great scene, though, where Adam revives his brother... And he slowly comes out of this box, just as the authorities and John show up. And the mummy carrying Annette, followed by Adam, flee into, like, this sea, like, in, through this door into the sewers. Yeah, underneath Adam's his house. house has sewer access. I guess. <laughs> it's, it's almost like Bruce Wayne's mansion, you know, like, you're going to have the bat boat out there. But there's this great scene, the third behanding. Adam's most of the way through this door, and when the authorities roll up, they just slam the door. <laughs> This large iron door right onto Adam's hand, and he falls back with this bloody stump, and he's swimming around in this sewer water, shrieking. It's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of blood. Um... (laughs) I know, it's like all in the water. It looks so good. And Adam's gonna kill Annette. He has has his brother, the mummy, place Annette on, like, this slab in the sewers. And he pulls out this little knife, he's gonna stab Annette, and then the mummy stops him. Both of them are one-handed, but the mummy's one hand overpowers Adam's one hand, and he Mm -hmm. drowns him. 
and I think there's like a like a line where Adam says, "Oh, you were always soft for the for pretty women or something." Both our movies today have the bad guy turn on another bad guy at the end, and it's not really that clear why <laughs> in, in either movies. So they're very similar yeah. climaxes. <laughs> But what's awesome about this climax is that after the mummy kills Adam, he walks over to this vaulted section of the sewers and just rips a stone out of the ceiling and lets himself be crushed and buried under this rubble and water. And yes. that's the end of the movie. It just ends abruptly. Well, <laughs> like no, the, the last line of the movie made zero sense to me. Do you remember what it was? No. There was a shot of some like Egyptian, part of an Egyptian tomb, and the line was like, rise my father or something like that and I'm like what who's saying this oh, well, the I father totally wasn't the out. father wasn't involved in this movie at all it was the two brothers so it was just strange but let's talk about this movie patrick what sure. did you think of the curse of the mummy's tomb i think it's okay i enjoyed it a lot more than the first time i saw it i mean i didn't remember much about it but i looked at my letterbox review and it was you know i think i gave it one and a half stars out of five, which is a little harsh. I don't think it's a great movie, but there's a couple performances I really liked. I liked Terrence Morgan as Adam. I thought he brought a real kind of personality and charisma to the role, and he, you know, chews the scenery a little bit when it's revealed that he's bad, but he's just, overall, he's, like, interesting as this mysterious figure. And then, obviously, I love Fred Clark as Alexander King. I think kind of the other performances I could take or leave, I think Ronald yeah, Howard. Agree. Ronald Howard as John Bray is pretty bad. I thought Giles was okay. Annette was pretty terrible. You know, it takes a long time to get going. Mm -hmm. But there is some interesting stuff along the way. And when it actually gets going, it's pretty satisfying, even though there's some character motivation things that I don't really get, i.e. Hashmi surrendering himself to the mummy and 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 then kind of the whole thing at the end i'm not really sure what happened but it has a couple of scenes that really stand out the presentation the unveiling mm -hmm. um the the al capone's tomb scene was pretty good the scene where adam beats the shit out of some <laughs> egyptian guy on the boat you know classic stuff yeah yeah i think it's a, an okay movie it's not as interesting as the 1959 mummy or the 1932 mummy but it it's probably more interesting than most of the sequels to the 1932 Mummy. Okay, yeah. Jim, what did you think? I thought it was pretty good. I really enjoyed it. But again, my complaints kind of line up with yours, as in most of the acting isn't that great. Most of the characters are really boring. And it just takes way too long to get going. Because like I said, I paused the movie the first time we see the Mummy up and walking around, and it was 50, I think it was 52.32. Out into of the movie into a, into a movie that's an hour and 20 minutes long yeah i don't know i i, I kind of liked the conflict between characters but the stuff specifically revolving around king and john and king and giles and then i guess giles and the egyptian government i like to me all of that was interesting yeah i liked all the king stuff the giles and the egyptian government it's kind of just background because at a certain point it's Hashmi has a problem with King and Giles is thrown to the side because he's drunk. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, everything with King is really good. He's just a very fun character. And I mean, e even his death, I think his death oh, was yeah, the best one in the movie. Oh yeah, that's a very good scene, yes. But yeah, just a bit of a slow burn, but it gets there in the end. You just gotta wade through a lot of boring nonsense before you get there. But other than that, it was it was a fine movie. I think it most suffers with the Bray and Annette characters because they're both so uninteresting and the performances aren't very good. And those are kind of our protagonists. It's an hour and 20 minute movie that takes almost an hour to get to a mummy. And <laughs> they're, they're still feeling like they're speeding past certain things. Like I mentioned that love triangle is nothing. Yeah. So the movie really doesn't have a strong protagonist. I think that's really its biggest problem. Though, you know, and I will say, though, a plus for the movie is all the background characters. Well, not all of them, but some of them. Like those two... The British English, guys. Yeah, yeah, they're fine. At the, yeah. the family where where Hashmi is staying. Uh, the the family that's renting out Oh, yeah, room. I liked, I liked the, um, the, the boarding house family. Yeah, they yeah. were... They get five seconds of screen time, but they're kind of fun. 
Exactly. And yeah. Ho- I mean, the hooker and the, all those people. Yeah, those characters are are standouts because they're background characters, but they do such a good job at what they're doing. And but other than that, again, it's really just like King, and Adam. And they're a little they're comedic relief without going too over the top. Mm-hmm. Also, the mummy itself, he's pretty threatening. He's pretty imposing. I think they, the look is decent i don't think it's great and i'm not sure where it falters it's just not perfect to me but it is an improvement over the christopher lee mummy i totally agree with you on that and i would actually say a better looking mummy is a character in our next movie the invisible man (laughs) well yeah yeah he's the invisible man but i mean if if our mummy looked a little bit more bandagey you know there's maybe a bit more definition in the face instead of just kind of their Oh, one one thing I didn't like about the looks, the mummy doesn't have a mouth. Yeah, there's yeah, no and curvature that's what I was about to bring up. Yeah. of the of the mouth. E- even I and I looked at pictures of this just to verify it. Christopher Lee, you know, his mouth doesn't open when he's the mummy, but you can tell there is a mouth there. So that's a, a difference that I think is for the worse. Even though they greatly improved the eyes, the eyes are just way too big on Christopher Lee, and here, yeah, the movement I think and the sound of them. And his, well, his yeah, imposing figure. I like the missing hand, too. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's move from one mo- mummy movie to another mummy movie. Puppet Master 2. His unholy creations hold the strings to your life. I know how to get into things. All right, so Puppet Master 2. <laughs> 1990, direct-to-video from producer Charles Band, who also came up with the story for this movie. He is, of course, the Puppet Master, as he (laughs) refers to himself. I actually think this could be the first movie you see in the Puppet Master series, even though it has continuity with the original, but I think they do a good job of kind of establishing what's going on. This movie is probably a deeper dive into Puppet Master lore. And Jim, I know you weren't really a fan of the first movie. I liked it more than you. I don't love it, but I think... You know, if you're curious about a Puppet Master film, this might be the best one to start with. I will agree with you because, spoiler alert, I enjoyed this movie a lot more than the first one. All right, so we begin with a very charming opening scene in a cemetery at night where Andre (laughs) Toulon's grave, Andre Toulon, of course, is the Puppet Master, the OG Puppet Master, played by... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Uncle Lewis from Christmas Vacation, who killed himself in the previous film right when Nazi spies were about to confront him. His grave is being dug up mainly by Pinhead, and all of the puppets are there. We've got Pinhead, who, and just a reminder for those of you that aren't Puppet Master fans, we got Leech Woman. <laughs> Leech Woman, her thing is she spits out leeches, although she doesn't do that in this movie, I don't No, I, and I actually forgot who it was. I had to look it up. Because I'm like, have yeah. we seen that puppet before? Yeah, is, is a leech woman. We got Blade, who is the signature. You know, if you see an image of any of the puppets from Puppet Master, it's going to be Blade. Blade has that kind of white, silverish face, and he's got a hook. And a hook for one hand and a, and a knife on the other. Mm-hmm. Pinhead, of course, is this big, this big muscular guy that just has a tiny head. And we've got Tunneler, who's just a guy who's got a drill on his on the top of his head he's my favorite and, actually that, that's a lie but sorry continue <laughs> and we've got jester jester i don't think we see anything of jester's abilities of like what he can do in terms of like fighting or killing but his thing is he's got multiple sections on his face that he can spin around and change from sad to happy and uh he was featured very briefly in the original film he didn't have much to do in that i don't think i think it was mostly pinhead blade Leech Woman, Tunneler. Now, in the original one, there was also like a like a Genghis Khan looking puppet. Yes. Does he show up sometime somewhere? He might show up later in the series. I don't know. They keep adding puppets. The Six Shooter is coming along at some point. I think maybe in the next film. You know, there's so many, so many puppets throughout the series. It's definitely, you know, if Blade Blade is the Godzilla, Pinhead and um, Tunneler, they're, they're probably your... Uh, mothras or rodans were there in like an awful lot of them <laughs> and then you got you got some biolantes who are only in one or two movies you know in the, in, in the puppets uh and we get one later on in this movie who 
at least in this movie, is my favorite. He might be my favorite overall, but we'll get to him. The puppets of Andre Toulon. First, they made you smile. And then, they made you die. Blade. Pinhead. Jester. Leech Woman. And Tunneler. These puppets dig up Toulon's grave, and then they pour some kind of liquid into it, and then you see these great big, we get a POV shot of these great big skeleton arms reaching up as the puppets look down the grave at him, and that's the opening scene. Then we cut to credits after that. I I, I loved that opening scene. There's just something about it. Was great. it. Though, did you notice that on the cemetery sign it was missing a T? Yeah, well, I, I didn't notice that here, but I noticed that during the daytime when the characters returned to that. I feel so stupid because that opening like it it opens on the cemetery sign and i was like creamery what's a <laughs> oh, I was, this no. look like a creamery after this in the daytime four parapsychologists carolyn and her brother patrick and then lance and wanda show up at the bodega bay inn which is where the majority of the first film took place this is where andre toulon killed himself in the 30s yeah, basically, this is where everything went down in that first film. This hotel is abandoned. It's owned by the state. And these parapsychologists, they work in, they, they're in some kind of government program. Yeah, what was it called? It was like the Paranormal Bureau yeah. or something. I mean, I knew the Pentagon had movie to just had money to just blow, but I didn't know they were into <laughs> this stuff. <laughs> so they're investigating what went down a year ago. So, this, so it's these four people, and they are also later joined by a mystic. So these people, these four, they're kind of weirdos. They kind of believe in ghosts, but they're people of science. Yeah. Even though Lance just seems like a big dumb jock guy, basically, who just flirts with the incredibly sexy Wanda. Wait, wait, is Lance the one that yells at the mystic? No, that's Patrick. Yeah, I like I like uh, Wanda, obviously. Oh yeah, Wanda is played by Charlie, I think it's it's pronounced Spradling, Spradling maybe? I, I've I never heard it. it said out loud. She was a bit of a B-movie, Scream Queen, Linnea Quigley type, but she didn't have nearly as long a career. Oh. But she's awesome. Virtually no other actors in this movie do I recognize, except for George Buck Flower, everybody's favorite cameo, everybody's favorite <laughs> bum, who's not a bum in this, he's just a bumpkin. <laughs> yes. He plays, I guess, a farmer. As far as, like, mainstream audiences go, Back to the Future, he's the homeless guy in Back to the Future, that's probably his best, most popular movie, but he's in... Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bullarama. He did a lot of like stuff with Full Moon and Charles Band. And yeah, he's just in so many things. He's usually a bum. And didn't he just but pass he, away recently? Uh, yeah, he passed away in the last 18 years. He, <laughs> he passed away <laughs> recently. Uh, I thought you were going to say 18 months. Never mind. 2004. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, you did that so well. You tricked me. <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking of Mr. Mr. Gulliger. He passed away recently. Yeah, Cool Gulliger died recently. So uh, it's a very, very different type of actor <laughs> from George. I don't know how you would possibly get those two mixed up. but I don't know. So anyways, George Buck Flower and his homely wife live in the middle of nowhere. And Camille. <laughs> homely the psych- wife. <laughs> Sorry, go on. She is. Camille, yeah. the, um, the medium or psychic or whatever stops and asks them for directions or help getting back or getting to Bodega Bay. And they, of course, warn her, like, oh, it's not a good idea. There's, like, some mention of, like, oh, there's maybe Satanist stuff going on. But she shows up at the hotel and works with these parapsychologists. She immediately is putting down all their gadgets and gizmos and computer stuff because, again, they're science people. She's just this weirdo who communes with spirits right she doesn't believe that you can uncover the truth with computers and cameras and stuff like yeah. that she she operates by feelings and this patrick has a problem with this and a problem he with thinks drinking. She, he thinks she's a lunatic carolyn's the only one who's actually like interested in having her there and like having her opinion and stuff like that and she does reveal she's not she's not a complete fraud 
you know, she's like, oh, something, I can sense something terrible has happened here, which, you know, I guess why would she be there if there wasn't? But this is when we get the, this is the dinner scene where Patrick humiliates her. But before that, we get a little bit of backstory as to what happened and, and most importantly to how, like what the official record is of the first movie. So nothing about puppets, obviously, <laughs> but multiple bodies disappeared and Alex Whitaker who was the Paul Lamatt, I think was his name. He was the protagonist in the first film. He was the only survivor. He is apparently at an insane asylum, and he said, apparently he said something about Andre Toulon, Andre Toulon, because when Carolyn and Patrick come across that name in some books, they're like, oh, this means that he's not a complete lunatic. He knows what he's talking about. So I, I don't know when that's established, but the hotel has fallen into disrepair since then. Also in the first movie, we saw like a lot more of the hotel and in this movie, we see a hallway and probably oh yeah three rooms. So were they maybe not allowed to film in the hotel? I was going to say, I, I, I thought that because we get lovely exteriors and to my untrained eye, it looked essentially like the same building. It might not have been. Yeah. But I do think I read that in the first movie they actually filmed inside the hotel, and it doesn't look like they did here. I would hazard a guess and say that they even built a hallway out of cardboard to make it look like the hotel that they just reused over and over and over again. It doesn't feel like a hotel when they're in it, and some of that is probably the sets they construct, but also just, I don't know, maybe this is accurate to the first movie too because the hotel is unoccupied except for the five or six principal characters in that so it just doesn't feel like that hotel but then again you wouldn't say that about the shining when there's only three characters in that entire movie so yeah it's, it's certainly an interesting look <laughs> listen this isn't the shining okay <laughs> no because you like puppet master too patrick it's yeah this is <laughs> call me crazy i enjoy this movie more than i enjoy the shining i do i've, I've seen it fewer times but I'm looking forward to the next rewatch far more than I'm looking forward to the next rewatch of The Shining. <laughs> so, at night, Camille wakes everyone with a scream, and everyone goes to see what's going on. She claims that she saw these figures in her room who, who had knives or something, and, and she's referring to the puppets, obviously, but when they go up there, the only thing in her room are just, like, two, like, Victorian dolls, but she is like, no, listen, we all need to get out of here because something bad is going to happen. So she is packing up to leave, but then she is attacked by the puppets. It's Pinhead and is it Leech Woman, I think? Yeah, and also isn't the main one there too? Well, oh, it's Pinhead and Jester I have in my notes. I knew oh, it was okay. Pinhead. Pinhead, like, knocks her down. Pinhead's the only one who's, like, a... Who has any strength to them, basically. The other yeah. ones just kind of <laughs> rely on their weapons. And the their rest abilities. you can pick them up and throw them against a wall. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we see that with Tunneler. We're very easily disposed yeah. of. <laughs> Quick question. Because, again, I'm super unfamiliar with the Puppet Master franchise. So if a puppet dies on screen or looks like it dies on screen, will it probably come back in a future movie? Uh, well, I, especially because the continuity is confusing because they go, there's retro Puppet Master where they go back in time. I mean, there's no time travel. It's just like prequels. So I'm going to say, yes, they appear in future movies. I'm not sure if in the series continuity they appear after the events of this movie. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. And I'll tell you what, they definitely appear in one of the movies because one of the movies, <laughs> it's the most shameless film I've ever seen. It's literally a clip show. It's like, you know what Seinfeld did for its 100th episode? Yeah. They, they released a Puppet Master movie that's just that. I don't know if it's um, the legacy of Puppet Master or Puppet Master Legacy. I remember I was like watching this movie, and I was like kind of <laughs> no. into the first few minutes, and then I'm like, this seems a little familiar. And then I'm seeing other <laughs> scenes, and I'm like, okay, this is just straight up the first Puppet Master. They show a scene from this movie where someone gets lit on fire, and it's like, yeah, it's it's shameless. They go through, like, movie by movie just to... <laughs> it, is that, it's is... the type of thing that, like, HBO Max would put out if a new season of Game of Thrones is coming out and they want to give, like, a 20-minute recap so that you yeah. can catch up with the new season. It's like that, but an hour and 20 minutes. And by the way, I want to say to any Canadians out there listening, Puppet Master 1, 2, and 3 are all available on Shudder.ca. For Americans, one, if you're as helpless as me and have a 
Full Moon Features account, you can view all Puppet Master films. <laughs> the exception of Puppet Master versus Demonic Toys, for whatever reason. I don't think they have the Littlest Reich on there either, which is the most recent the one. The Littlest Reich? <laughs> or the most recent full one, because recently what Full Moon has been doing is they, they're making um, spin-off Puppet Master movies. They, they made a Blade one, and they made a Dr. Death one. I saw the Blade one. I thought it was pretty good. I don't even remember the character of Dr. Death when he comes up in that series, so I don't know <laughs> if I'll see that one. But yeah, and then a lot of them are on Tubi also, because Full Moon, so many Full Moon movies are on Amazon or Tubi, you know, Prime Tubi. So you'll be able to, in fact, I saw the, um, I noticed that the Video Zone featurettes for Puppet Master and Puppet Master 2 were both on Tubi as well. Back to the film, Camille is captured. She's not killed, at least not here, and she disappears into the night and the others think that she just she was so upset that she just took off apparently without her stuff and at this point carolyn calls camille's son and talks to him and and says like hey have you seen her just so you know we, we don't know where she is and he apparently says that no she does kind of just wander off from time to time she's a weirdo <laughs> right <laughs> then the next night tunneler gets into patrick's room drills a hole into his head killing him and this actually wanda and lance are aggressively flirting with each other while they're watching the security monitors Very and they see <laughs> they see this puppet going in so they run and they're too late to save patrick but lance does beat the shit out of tunneler seemingly <laughs> killing him again we don't really i'm not that up on my puppet master lore Lance um, Lance yeah. is the Adam of this movie, and Tunneler is the random Egyptian man with a knife of this movie. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so the next scene, they perform an autopsy on Tunneler and find that even though there's gears and things like that, it does appear to be self-powered as if it's an artificial life form. And there was a line, I think it's by Wanda, she's like, well, it looks like Patrick may have led us to the greatest discovery in science or something. And I think this is her attempt to kind of make Carolyn feel better about the situation. But meanwhile, yeah, her brother's yeah. head has just been drilled into <laughs> by a puppet. Like, it doesn't really work. Yeah, yeah. She's trying to console her. Like, after <laughs> she's been weeping for like a day or whatever. She's like, well, if it makes you feel any better. Well, in general, I, I feel like Carolyn doesn't react to her brother's death the way you would expect her to. She kind of... I don't want to say she completely moves on, but strikes up a romance a few days later. Like, she's doing all right for herself. Well, yeah, well, you screw know, given, her brother, because now she's got a new man in her life, and that's... So then, a mysterious man dressed like the Invisible Man from the <laughs> 1933 Claude Rains uh, film yeah. shows up at the hotel, claims he is... what? What's his name? Eric? Eric something or other. It's pretty clear to the viewer that this is Andre Toulon. Because we saw Andre Toulon get resurrected. He's covered in bandages because there's obviously something going on with his face. He's super mysterious. He claims to own the hotel. He says that, you know, he actually owns this, but he's never been here since it fell into his possession because he was off in Hungary or something. He does speak mm -hmm. with a heavy accent and not very good accent, although, you know, whatever. Everyone else is immediately suspicious of him, but... He's, I mean, he's creepy, but he's a little friendly to them. He's like, listen, I'll let you guys stay here so long as you just don't bother me in my living quarters. Like, okay, yeah. you guys keep doing whatever science stuff you're doing. And it's like, okay, he didn't have to be that nice. But mm -hmm. they also say that, you listen, we're, we're going to need you to prove that you own this place too, because the state owns it as far as we know. Yeah. And there's like a, even a line he says, he's like, well, how do I prove that? And they're like papers. And he goes, oh, I don't keep government papers. I don't believe in it. Or something. Oh, well, maybe that's he's got so many paper cuts, that's why he's bandaged. <laughs> that's right. He actually has a fear of papers. <laughs> so then someone else shows up, and as Wanda says, I sure hope this person's normal or whatever. And he is. He is Michael, or Mike, <laughs> Camille's son, who kind of immediately Carolyn lets in on what's going on. She shows him the, the puppet, like, just kind of like, like, not just like, hey, yeah, we still haven't seen your mother but no just flat out like yeah a puppet killed my brother last night like oh i would have um <laughs> yeah i would not have led with that yeah i would have but... said maybe hello first but you know <laughs> then at night we get a wonderful scene at george buckflower and his homely wife's 
country house where leech woman breaks in kills george buckflower and then his wife gets up grabs a shotgun and starts going to town eventually throws <laughs> leech woman into the furnace but then we also have blade going around there and she's ready to shoot blade when a new puppet emerges this puppet is named torch for obvious reasons he is awesome he's got like almost bullets for teeth like really kind of interesting very metallic face he looks like a little itty bitty World War Two ger- like German soldier. He's got like a helmet on, and he does, yeah. like you said, have bullets for teeth. And he's got these cool red robot eyes. And yeah, the he's eyes wearing are like neat. a little like army uniform. And the big thing, he's got a flamethrower for an arm, <laughs> and he, and he lights up this woman, and it's fantastic. Uh. I loved this scene so much. And Andre Toulon is proud to present. The newest addition to his terrifying troop. You may think you've got the powers of hell on your side. Torch. Just the whole scene of the puppets raiding this farmhouse is great. Whenever you get to watch the puppets do something, it's exciting. Sure. But having like three puppets hanging out, like I think when Blade shows up, he slices the back of this frumpy farmer's leg and then he dives under a couch. Mm -hmm. And, like, it looks so stupid, but I love it. I loved every second of this. Well, also, we got to talk about the the actual puppet effects, too. I don't know if this movie had a bigger budget or if it was just the way it was shot, but the effects are so much better in this movie. They really are. I mean, I know the director of this movie, um, I don't believe, was involved in the original film. He was a stop-motion animator. Oh. And he, he was involved in... Like, he, he, he's nominated for Academy Awards, or at least one, for the young Sherlock Holmes. And so he was in some, like, big things. And he, I don't think he did the effects on this movie, but I have a feeling he just knows how to shoot these effects better than David Schmoller, the director of the original Puppet Master. Overall, we get more stop motion in this movie, mm-hmm. and it's better in this movie. And there's a few scenes where it looks really good. There's the famous scene. To me, this is my favorite shot in the entire Puppet Master series when Blade jumps off the bed and goes chasing after... Uh, so it goes running at the camera, kind of chasing after someone. That shot is just awesome. Yeah, it's great. And even, even when it's not stop motion, I think just the puppeteering is better in this movie for whatever reason. I was really impressed with it. I thought this was... As close as you can get to seamless with a 1990 direct-to-video, cheap-ass, Charles Band-produced Puppet Master movie. I really do think so. If you're going to film these puppets in a dark room, it's going to be easy to hide wires that you're using to kind of manipulate these puppets so you don't have to do stop motion and stuff. I did notice one wire at one point. I I can't remember which scene it was. Me as well. It was was like near the bottom of the screen. That's when I noticed it. Yeah, a shot of the puppet walking across the screen. Yes. um, but there's like a scene in the middle of the day. It's coming up shortly where this kid is talking to Torch. And everything looks great. Like, I, I don't know how, like, I don't think it could have just been stop motion. They must have, like, green screened out some wires or something. Because, like, it, it looks amazing. Like, this little puppet <laughs> exists in our world. You know, it's, it's so cool. And he's also not a little puppet. Sorry, by the way, this puppet's fucking huge. This Torch puppet. Like, when yeah, the kid picks him up, you, you see realize the kid how big he is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, anyways, that that's a fun scene where the torch probably kills a little kid. Very Frankenstein <laughs> scene. So then we get a scene of Andre Toulon in his laboratory. I don't know if the other Puppet Master movies do this so much. I'm sure some of them do. But this has a little bit of a sci-fi element to it where it's not just fantasy. I think in the previous film, I think it was basically just... I don't think they went into detail. I think he just made the puppets move on their own kind of through magic. Like, yeah. It was yeah. just like, oh, he's a sorcerer, I guess, or something. We, yeah. we, we didn't really know. Here, it's he was originally just a really, really good puppeteer. We see this in a flashback. Some Egyptian guy burned his puppets to the ground with his eyes <laughs> and then introduced Tulan and his wife to a new formula for creating life so that he could make stringless puppets to do his to do whatever he wanted with them and his wife in the flashbacks is 
the same actress as that plays Carolyn. Yes, yeah. So Toulon thinks that Carolyn is the reincarnation of his wife. When Carolyn wakes up really early and Mike comments on that, she's like, oh, I always felt that if I woke up after six, the day was lost or something. And then when she speaks to Toulon, who's being his creepy self in his Invisible Man cosplay, he <laughs> says like, oh, my, you're, you're up early. You're just like my wife. My wife always, and he says like the same thing. My wife always felt that if she woke up after six, the day was wasted. So it's like, okay, maybe she actually is the reincarnation or maybe that's just a coincidence. We don't really know. But yeah, so we have that flashback scene, and and, and in that flashback, it's Carolyn, the one that really wants Toulon to delve into this science magic, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Toulon doesn't seem that interested in it, but he's got nothing to do. His puppets are destroyed as he's doing a performance of Faustus to Egyptian people to, in a small tent. In 1912. With about six people. <laughs> And the two kids in the front, very clearly in brown face, they are Charles Band's sons, which or maybe son and daughter. Let me look up. Alex Band and Taryn Band. I'm assuming Taryn's a girl. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming Alex is a boy, too. I guess <laughs> that could go either way. But one of them was definitely I'll a boy, it. at least. But yeah, so brown face in both films today. That's not a good sign. Egypt in both but films, good sign. <laughs> Egypt in both. Well, uh, I was talking about the brown face oh, specifically. Sorry. I'm open to giving it a pass in this movie because, I mean, it still looks bad. It's still messed up. But Charles Band is like, hey, I think it, I think it would be really fun to give my kids a small role in this movie. Oh, we only have one kid with the torch scene. We need a scene with two kids. Oh, there's this other scene. Oh, I guess we have to put shoe polish on their faces. Like, I, that's the only <laughs> way we can do it. Like, I don't know, but but yeah. it's also like, this is a low-budget movie. I can sort of understand they're not getting actual people of color for this scene. I mean, it still looks yeah. bad, but I can, I'm can. i more willing to excuse it in this movie than in Curse of Puppet Master, Plus it's a, it's a, or it, than in Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. Excuse me, there is a Curse of Puppet Master. I was going to say Curse no. of Puppet Master, that's great. That's a film. <laughs> it's also a bigger part of the other movie. Here, it's just a really small, it's like one shot or two shots or something. You know, it's really Yeah, brief. I mean, and, and, and I agree with you because, like, saying that it's okay in this movie, or that it's it's more acceptable, I should say, is fine because you're so right it is like this low budget thing. i underst i understand it in context i guess is what i'm saying yeah because i mean like it would be like if spielberg had people in brown face for indiana jones and the raiders of the lost ark like you don't need to you know and they didn't need to with the curse of the mummy's tomb especially for characters that didn't have speaking lines yeah you know <laughs> anyways back at the laboratory we're not fully sure what Toulon's up to. We know Jester is, like, sick or weak or something, and he needs to create more of that formula in order to make Jester strong. We don't know if Jester has, like, a temporary life or what, what exactly the deal is. Then these other puppets show up, and they bring pieces of the body. They, they're they scooping out brain matter uh, and the eye in the case of, I think, George Buckflower's eye. And... <laughs> He gets upset because because the the brain matter they they pull from uh, George Flower's wife is all charred because Torch just <laughs> burned her and he's he's upset that Torch who contextually you know he's the newest puppet we've never seen him before maybe he was just created we don't know it looks like he was just created okay but yeah I was going to say that he hasn't learned how to control himself yet he's he's the child. This is magnificent storytelling here. Magnificent character work for this torch puppet. Um, <laughs> well, and also, too, the actor playing Toulon, he does such a great job of talking to all the puppets like they are children. Yeah, I, I agree. That's I, Overall, I don't think this is a great performance or anything. He does He's doing the goofy accent, like, the entire time. Mm -hmm. But there is something about the way he acts with the puppets, the way he acts off of them, the way we get those cutaways to the puppets, like acknowledging him whether it's just torch's eyes kind of glowing or a blade nodding or something like that it's reasonably well done well and, and and it makes them all feel very very real and part of exactly. this world yeah so tuan is at first i thought maybe he was like trying to like he couldn't remember he was trying to rediscover how to create this this formula that will allow him to bring things to life. But no, I think he just needs more brain matter to do it. 
Mm-hmm. So the puppets are supposed to go out and kill people, but they need to do it discreetly because they can't get a bunch of people's attention, obviously. Yeah, and, and and as he said, they've already brought too much attention on themselves by killing four people. So then um, across town, or again kind of out in the country somewhere, a little kid who lives in like a trailer park, or <laughs> not a trailer park, there's just one trailer, he lives in a trailer, <laughs> um, stumbles upon Torch, but... I, I like this. He it's it's we've seen scenes like this, right, where a kid stumbles upon the thing. But this this movie makes the kid doing something just genuinely weird. Like yeah. he's taking a Ken doll and he's whipping it because he's an Indiana Jones fan. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, he's like he's like die strange. you Nazis, you know. Yeah, which but, is but what's kind a kid of, doing with a whip? That's the you know? <laughs> yeah. So the classic bull whip. He also is able to accidentally, but he's able to actually grab around Ken because he ends up flinging Ken backwards into the bushes, which he didn't mean to do. But then when he goes <laughs> to look for Ken, that's when he comes across Torch, and he starts whipping Torch. He kind of abuses him, and he, <laughs> he, well, the weird part is, I mean, I, yeah. overall, I like this scene. <laughs> I like how it's kind of weird and stupid, but yeah. it's also strange because this is a kid who, like, you know, he's, it's, this is his imagination. He's Indiana Jones. He's out there whipping a Nazi Ken doll. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. the weird part is he doesn't imagine he's Indiana Jones. He specifically imagines he's Indiana Jones on a movie set. Yes. Yeah. He's like, I'm the director. You have to do something. You know, he's talking to Torch. And it's like, Kids don't think like that. <laughs> this this is written by this scene was written by a filmmaker. This does not f- yeah. seem like a six year old kid. But well, also, I also, like I it. like that he's whipping a Ken doll, and he's like, "Ah, oh, die, Nazi!" And then an actual little tiny Nazi comes out of the bushes. Yeah. and <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Okay, so you mentioned the Nazis. We have Nazis throughout the Puppet Master series. This has always been confusing to me. The puppets are generally the bad guys, and yet. Andre Toulon was hunted by Nazis. Yeah. And it's like, and he created these things. And this guy should be a good guy, right? And the puppets should maybe be good guys. The puppets are good guys in some of the movies. And in some of the movies, specifically, they're fighting Nazis. Yeah. Or even like at the beginning of the first movie, they were good guys. They were just little puppets. They were hanging out. Well, they were neither neither good nor bad, I yeah. guess, really. But but yeah. Didn't the Nazis want Toulon because they wanted to know his like secrets of how to make? Yeah, I, I think so. like, yeah. Life puppets. That's that's, <laughs> that's definitely the um, implication because we get a lot more of Toulon in Puppet Master Three, which might be the best in the series. It's arguable. It's up there because that one I think takes place entirely in in the Nazi Germany. <laughs> every Patrick every. <laughs> Every word that comes out of your mouth with this series <laughs> and this movie, like, it sounds so stupid, but I know it's all Listen, true. This is classic schlock filmmaking, right? I mean, it's if you're going to involve <laughs> Nazis at some point, like, why not go all out? Well, even in like even in this movie, when you're talking about Toulon, you're like, yeah, he's sitting there in his uh, in his Invisible Man cosplay, and it's like it sounds so stupid, but it's so true, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's a hundred percent what it is. This entire movie feels like a bit of a love letter to the Universal Monster movies because with him and Carolyn, and Carolyn possibly being the reincarnation of his dead wife, that's very the Mummy, nineteen thirty-two, yeah. or, or Dracula to a certain extent. So it's really just kind of combining the classics here, and we're molding it into something that's modern and new and a little, you know, it's kind of a slasher movie. The first one wasn't really, I mean, but overall it's just like an enjoyable, kind of sleazy, kind of cheap movie, I think. But, it, you know, not without its highlights. Not without its lowlights. (laughs) What, okay, let's. What are the lowlights? Well, you know, of, I'm of this being movie? serious here. Yeah, I mean, other than it's just dumb that it's a movie about killer puppets. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there really are no because we were able to overlook that with Child's Play. Yeah, you and know, you know, like, and uh, in my opinion, this movie really isn't are... as good as Child's Play, but you know, the same no. Kind I, of... And again, I agree with that. But in my opinion, there really aren't any low points of this movie. The only thing that I could ever possibly complain about is that the characters just aren't that interesting. Or, or good 
Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, by, I, by the characters, I, I mean the people in the hotel. I don't mean like too long. Carolyn, puppets. Yeah. Wanda. Like they're kind of boring and stupid and I don't care about them. Hey, because, Wanda's hot. It's okay. Well, yeah, she's, uh, listen, I totally agree. <laughs> but you're like, you're there to see the puppets and that's what the show is. And yeah. this movie definitely delivered on the puppets. Whereas my issue with the first movie was that it didn't really deliver on the puppets. Like there were puppet things, but you didn't see them that much doing that many things. Sure. You know, this they're running around and killing people and shooting flamethrowers out of their hands and, you know, it's awesome. I will say though, and this this was as shocking as anything in this film. I may go so far to say that Puppet Master 2 may have the best romance we've seen on this podcast. I have a feeling you'll disagree, but okay. think of one that's better. Now, hold on, but are we talking about the romance between Toulon and his dead wife? Or no, talking- <laughs> fuck that. That's just, no, we're talking about Mike here. <sighs> I think this is well done. I, I do, Carolyn and Mike, because this is the next scene where we can tell pretty early on Carolyn is into Mike. Mike's probably into her one night when the, when Carolyn is watching the security cameras. Uh, it's like 1 in the morning or something. or it's, No, it's 11, I think they say. Wanda comes in, relieves her. And says, hey, Mike is opening up a bottle of wine and he doesn't want to drink by himself. So go hang out with him. And they go and they talk to each other. And this felt authentic to me. This this really felt like Carolyn is super into him. But she's still kind of waiting for him to make a move so that she's yeah. not misreading the signals. And eventually they're like, hey, he, Mike's like, I found all these records. And it's like a phonograph machine or whatever. And they're like, hey, do you want to dance? And they start dancing and or they're about to dance and then Toulon interrupts things and <laughs> and insists on a dance with her and then uh, it's just really awkward and then Mike eventually interrupts and Toulon before leaving says something about like how rude he is and then as he's leaving he like knocks over the music and the phonograph and he's like oh you know whatever I'm sorry but <laughs> <laughs> yeah this was good i liked this stuff I, I liked all the stuff with mike and carolyn you know and, there, and there i agree passionate love scene that follows this which is pretty classy for, for, for a charles band movie we don't see any nudity so i was in, also going to comment on that because that's a very classy love scene for a movie one of this caliber and it does show actual passion on screen it does so you know what you might be right i'm telling this... you this is a good romance for a genre film that where it's, it's obviously not a romance movie it's not a drama this is a strong love story for a movie like this and i think you're right i'm i'm inclined to agree with you mainly because i can't think of any other actual relationships that we see on screen other well than... yeah no even the even you know because we've done a lot classier movies than puppet master 2 don't get me wrong but like some of the movies, they, they don't even bother with that. Like, Night of the Living Dead, mm-hmm. no love story whatsoever. Alien, no love story whatsoever. Even though apparently Ridley Scott wanted to have a lot of fucking in that movie, as you were telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of the other movies, it's like, okay, you know, Frankenstein, you know, the, we already have this, like, established relationship. King Kong, Driscoll just sucks as a, as a character. Yeah, or even, or even the Mummy movie that we just paired with this movie terrible fucking love story yeah it, it, absolutely so weirdly this is a strength for this film i did not expect <laughs> that this is this was shocking to me now the show has begun again and this time their master is back from beyond the grave you brought me back wanda at some point when she was supposed to be manning the cameras has gone and has had sex with lance she realizes she should go back and check on the cameras. And as she's leaving, this is she hears Lance screaming. She goes back, sees Blade like cutting up his body. And this is the shot I mentioned earlier when Blade jumps off the bed and runs at her, which is just a beautiful, beautiful shot. And he kills her. So those two characters are gone. So we only have Mike and Carolyn. Carolyn wakes up in the morning again, early in the morning, notices Eric outside. At this point, I've kind of brushed over this, but she thinks that he, Eric Toulon, has something to do with the missing mystic psychic person and also thus 
maybe the puppets and maybe something to do with Patrick's death. I, I also, I love how he plays his character as this kind of weirdo who pretends to not know anything, but in most scenes that you see him, he's just smoking a cigarette through his bandages. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he's just like hanging out like, oh, it's another beautiful day to be alive. Yeah. Now, Mike has tried to dissuade her from looking into him just because he might be dangerous. If he has something to do with what she fears that he might, he's probably dangerous and don't go into his living quarters. But when she notices him outside, she decides to do that. And this was planned by Toulon because Toulon knows she rises early. And so he knows that he can kind of rely on her curiosity. And then he goes and follows her into his own place. She stumbles upon giant human-sized puppets, which are pretty creepy. They're they're terrifying. (laughs) These are um, Toulon and his wife Elsa is his wife, which I didn't really get that at first. Let it go, let it go. So he captures her, ties her to a chair, and he explains everything. He says, hey, you're my dead wife. (laughs) I'm Toulon. (laughs) I am going to slit my throat over a funnel that is in the mouth of this puppet Toulon and I will come back as this puppet. And she thinks he's crazy, obviously, but he does it and then he comes back as the puppet and this is a human actor in puppet-like makeup and it's disturbing. Like, it's creepy and it's it's good makeup and... It's just unsettling seeing it's, it's this, very seeing this guy unsettling because it's kind of like that like uncanny valley sort of thing. Very much so, yeah. But what's even more unsettling, we see Toulon take his bandages off and he's like this disgusting right. rotted corpse. <laughs> yeah, it was it's it's a good makeup look on the actual Toulon who's got like a he's not he's not a skeleton. Like mm-hmm. He's got but but he looks nasty and it, it's wonderful. He's, he's like the make, Crypt Keeper, but without a little eyes. Bit. It looks like Keith Richards, but... <laughs> so, he is planning on killing her. Well, he has to ha- force her to drink this potion, this formula, the same thing that I guess brought Jester back, because Jester is back at full strength. And he's going to kill her, and she's going to go into this puppet version of her, or of Elsa. Then the puppets turn on him for reasons kind of unknown. Yeah, I thought it was because they realized that he just kind of used them for his evil plot, but like they knew he was evil and they that know that they're the thing. evil. I think so. I th- yes, I think that's the thing. Except if the puppets are mad at him for using them for evil, They've been completely complicit throughout the movie. This is weird that this they're just now realizing it. If that is what's going on, I'm not 100% sure because the ending of this movie is incredibly confusing. But, <laughs> well, this is, this is before the puppets turn against him, of course. Excuse me, I'm going back. But Mike survives an assassination attempt by Torch. He eventually has to fight the puppets like one by one in this hotel. Yeah. Which is awesome. He he used the fire extinguisher at Torch, and then he just throws it at him eventually, which is wonderful. <laughs> Pinhead swings at him on a chandelier. He sees Blade messing around with his mother's body in the dumbwaiter. But he eventually he fights through all these puppets. He gets to Toulon's quarters, and it's when he shows up that the puppets turn against Toulon. And yeah. like I said... I don't fully understand why they're doing it, but I am glad they're doing it because it's amazing. We get green blood, which I guess is the the reanimated thing because I I think in the original Puppet Master, the main bad guy in that also had green blood, I think. And that was another, like the puppets kind of just turned against him. Although that was, in that case, it was because he put down the puppets and he said he didn't like them or something. Yeah, he was like, you're all stupid and you work for me or whatever. Maybe a little bit less motivation here, but it's wonderful. We get, you know, they're smashing his hands, they're stabbing him, and then eventually, of course, (laughs) Torch just lights him up, and he, while on fire, falls out the window, and it's amazing. (laughs) It is. It's spectacular. It's a spectacular end to uh, an interesting, strange movie. Well, it's not the end, of course, because it gets stranger. But, so, Carolyn and Mike, the only survivors... 
Carolyn says that they have to just drop everything. They can't keep looking into things. Then we see a scene with the female human-sized puppet, who again was puppet Tulan's wife, puppet Elsa. This was supposed to be the puppet that Carolyn would become. And she's apparently voiced by the woman that played Camille, the psychic, Mike's mother. Yeah. And she's driving a van with Pinhead in the front seat, and she wants to stop off at a children's mental asylum to perform puppetry for them. And she's like, if the kids notice anything weird, it's fine. They're crazy. Like, we can just get away with it. And that's how the movie ends. It's really strange. Like, this is, again, going back to Elsa as a character. We didn't get much of her, but we could kind of see that she was the one who wanted Toulon to do the sorcery, to the the magic science sorcery stuff. Yeah. And here, I'm not sure what the ending is. I don't know if it's nefarious. I don't know if she just wants to be an entertainer, just like she was in 1912. Or, yeah, if she's evil or i don't know how she became how she's back to life i don't understand jack shit about any of this well i'll tell you it makes no sense to me i'll tell you my friend i was just as confused as you and i thought maybe somehow toulon put his soul into the female puppet like last minute somehow yeah but looking at wikipedia because we see jester in the dumbwaiter with the body of mike's mom oh it was jester okay i thought it was blade but he's there, and then when the dumbwaiter disappears, he's got, like, a cup or something that he's holding. Apparently, according to Wikipedia, Jester goes back to Camille's body with the remaining, with the remainder of the formula. And after her soul has been placed into the female mannequin, the revived Camille decides to drive the puppets to the Boldeston Institution for the Mentally Troubled Tots and Teens. So there's no Elsa, is what you're saying. No, Elsa there's is no not Elsa. reincarnated. This She's is just not Camille. Reincarnated. This is just Camille why? in Elsa's body. Why does she want to do puppetry stuff? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just as confused. And I don't know why. Maybe is it to make them better? Because all the puppets are kind of like kids. So like they're going to a place for troubled tots to not only hang out and but also entertain. I, I don't know. No, but she does have that line about how like if they notice something is afoot, it's not going to matter because no one will believe them. So that's implying that she's that she's not just trying to i don't know it's a yeah. strange ending but that's it that is puppet master 2 jim what did you think of this movie i liked it a lot more than i should have i think <laughs> i i was again this movie built on all my complaints from the first one my big complaint from the first one was that there weren't enough puppets doing things and this movie delivered I liked the little flashback of, of Cairo and this ugly little goblin puppet that was there. I like all oh, the Oh, yeah. Weird... He's got a name, too. I don't know what it is. He, I, he probably shows back up in the in Oh, the really? Series. I'm not sure. I just... I well, just... I was on the Full Moon Direct site, and they've got a bobblehead of him or something like that <laughs> for sale. But yeah, I like all the uh, the magic and science-y stuff. Like, I, I just really like this movie, and I don't know what it is that makes me like it, but... I... <laughs> I'm just really taken with this awful movie. Listen, I, this is a fine film, and I, I, I agree with you. I enjoy it probably more than I should, too. And, and, I, and I do agree. It's an improvement over virtually everything from the first movie. We get a lot more puppets. Mm-hmm. We get better effects, A, with the puppets, and B, with the gore effects, the mm-hmm. makeup effects. Oh, for even, sure. Even Toulon's face. All that stuff is awesome. Get people on fire. <laughs> My biggest complaint about the original wasn't the lack of puppet action, even though I do think, I mean, I I agree with you, there could have been a lot more. My complaint was that there wasn't much of a plot. There was, like, everyone shows up at the hotel, and they kind of just hang around until things happen. And this movie feels much stronger in structure, where we have... They're showing up to investigate these events that happened a while ago. They see things or suspect things that change the stakes, and suddenly Patrick's dead, and now they've discovered that these puppets have life, and Wanda's got her tits out at one point, which is wonderful, <laughs> and um, not really plot, but um, uh, it drove appreciated me, nonetheless. Yeah, I, well, and, uh, and, and that's the thing, though. Like, we have an actual plot, but... I think my favorite thing about the plot in this movie is that it goes off the fucking rails. 
you know, like there's so many like things going on that we don't understand. And then the way yeah, the ends... reincarnation stuff, I don't yeah. know. It, 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 at the end of the day, I don't know if Carolyn is the reincarnation. Yeah, there's just so many or even like why why are there random farmers next to a hotel in California? Like, you know what I mean? Why are they like they're not they're not bumpkins? even close to the hotel. They're just out there. They're not even close. I don't. Think. Oh, OK. Yeah, I, I, but I just like I just like it. The farmer people were great. The guy who plays too long, terrible accent, but he's kind of fun to watch on screen. And, and as you said, the cosplay of the Invisible Man, like that's all great. The look oh, is course. great. The flashback is great. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun movie. It really is a midnight movie, and th- and that's what I love about it. Yes, it, incredibly entertaining. I was like with it the whole way through. I was interested in the puppet master mythology. <laughs> this yeah, is not yeah. a, an interest that will last movie to movie. I'm sure. Like, because, mm-hmm. you know, last week we did the Blair Witch Project and I said, like, you know, as great as the Blair Witch Project is, I would like to see kind of more traditional depictions of it. I just want to know more about the mythology because I'm interested in that. Puppet Master, there's like 15 movies. I'm sure the mythology gets stupid and or inconsistent at one time or another. Mm-hmm. So I'm, you know, I'm sure the mythology is bound to disappoint. But I'm still interested. Like, this this movie made me want to go and like watch the rest of the puppet master movies again and i didn't think a movie could make me want to do that i I think really at the end of the day because like i saw the movies and there was like a handful that i enjoyed but they didn't really stick with me this movie for whatever reason i think will stick with me at least now well and i mean you know coming from somebody who really didn't like the first puppet master this movie got me on board with the franchise and i'm excited to see the rest for this podcast yeah you see you see the potential you see i do yeah this movie's just a lot more fun than the first puppet master whether it's people on fire awesome <laughs> gore or just or tits you know <laughs> puppets doing more things there's tits in the first one too oh yeah that's right yeah there are so jim which of these two movies, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb or Puppet Master 2, do you prefer? Puppet Master 2. I was just blown away. I went in with no expectations thinking, fuck, Patrick's making me sit through another fucking Puppet Master movie. And I hated the first one. Hey, it's been like two years. <laughs> that was season one. It was a long time ago. But no, I walked away loving it. I think it's fantastic. And again, it's making me excited for the rest of the series. If the mummy was killing people throughout the movie from minute one to the end, I might have given it to the mummy, or I might have reconsidered. It would be closer, at least, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But it's definitely Puppet Master 2 all the way. How about you? For me, it's it's easily Puppet Master 2. You definitely enjoyed The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb more than I did, it sounds like, but I, th- I think I'm looking at a complete overhaul of that movie to make to make me like it more than Puppet Master 2. Puppet Master 2, I was like on board from minute one. I thought that opening <laughs> scene with the puppets <laughs> reviving Toulon was so neat. Yeah. I thought just about everything else after that was really entertaining. I was interested. I liked the scenes with Toulon creeping on her and cutting in on the dancing and like even stuff like that. Curse the Mummy's Tomb, not a bad film, but really a hard one to get excited about, I think. And I agree. Puppet Master 2, in theory, is a hard film to get excited about, but then you actually see it and it's like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. I know. Awesome Awesome with an asterisk on it, maybe, but it's awesome. (laughs) Awesome with an asterisk. Hey, if we start making merch, can we get a shirt that's just awesome with an asterisk on the the end? Sure, you keep mentioning the shirts. You can, you you need to get on that if you're that interested because I don't know. <laughs> but no, you know, g- going back to uh, the Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. If you're like me and you like ancient Egypt and that kind of stuff, and it is a little hokey, it's fun to watch, and you can see where like a movie like The Mummy with Brendan Fraser kind of got like a lot of the imagery from, like when you have stuff on the boat, when you just have like the the mummy in that dark dank alleyway killing um, King. It's very reminiscent of that 1999 movie. Okay. And I I do like that 99 movie a lot, and I do like yeah. Egypt stuff. And, like, for me, sure. it was a fun movie to watch, but only the last half hour of that movie is really fantastic. But all of Puppet Master 2 is great. <laughs> and I guess I, I, I that last half hour is good. I didn't think it was fantastic. I think it was the big difference between you and me with The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. 
it certainly elevated the movie because the movie was not doing too hot before that but mm-hmm. but to me it was it never brought it to the heights of George Buckflower's homely overweight wife getting lit on fire <laughs> by torch in torch's <laughs> first appearance what a great scene what a memorable yeah, scene yeah he's great well how how do you think this stacks up as a double feature though well in theory i would like to do this every time but with time and my sometimes terrible attention span i usually don't watch them back to back this time i did and i thought it was good i was surprised at how many connections there were i i didn't remember egypt being a part of puppet master 2 resurrection i guess is a is a theme so is yep. blackface so is <laughs> it's a theme blackface is the is a theme <laughs> There were way more things that these two movies had in common than I was expecting, but I just think in general, Pup Master 2 is about an hour 30, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb about an hour 20, so a good, you know, a manageable length double feature I think never hurts. And then also, like, you get that slow build up with Curse of the Mummy's Tomb that eventually goes off into a pretty exciting last half hour and then that, to me, is is a good transition to Puppet Master Two, which is pretty exciting, right off the for, bat for me from the for right off the bat. Even though it 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 has build up, it it's not completely insane from the start or anything. You know, it it, it builds at a fine pace. Um, so I I think they're good together. What about you, Jim? I agree with you. And and building off what you said there, we do have some similarities between them, but even. Again, just touching on the mummy itself only being in the last half hour, you have a monster movie where like it's only in a third of the movie. But then you have a monster but then you follow that up with a monster movie where they're right at the very beginning. Like mm-hmm. in the first scene, essentially. When well, you get a variety of monsters too. Well exactly. And well in, also... in both films you kinda sorry to cut you off, but in That's both okay. films you have the monsters are kind of doing someone else's bidding Mm -hmm. and then the real bad guy ultimately is adam and it's toulon in Mm -hmm. both cases the monsters turn against them in both cases it's not 100 percent clear why (laughs) Um, (laughs) exactly yeah but 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 i do like the the variety of monster you get a guy that has got knives and hooks for hands you've got a woman that spits out leeches even though she doesn't do that in this movie (laughs) For whatever reason, yeah. <laughs> you get you get a flamethrower arm monster. You get creepy, disfigured face monster who dresses like the Invisible Man for a long period of time. Though. And then you get puppet uh, jester with the multiple faces who doesn't really do anything either, but he's he's always fun to look at. Well, and I also like the idea that in in the Mummy or the Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, pardon me, we have this like half-assed, half-flushed-out love story. And then we transition to a movie with, like, a, a really beautiful and romantic and passionate love story in it. <laughs> beautiful is a bit yeah. strong, but sure. Passionate love story in it. And then, But then they also throw in the classic B-movie stuff with Wanda and Lance, which is just... There's no substance to that relationship. They just flirt. And, yeah, what, what, what was um, one and, of the lines and, she And you dropped? see Wanda's boobs. That's about it. Yeah. What was one of the lines she dropped? She was like, oh, yeah, I was trying to sleep by counting sheep, but but these sheep just kept falling under a horny ram. And I was like, what? <laughs> She's also really offended that? that he apparently has a shower after they have sex. Yeah. She's, like, offended I, by that. I, 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 that was strange. I'll be honest. I like to shower. Maybe not right after, but, you know. Sure. I mean, it's 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 common courtesy i I just i don't don't understand that that was that was strange but it's seconds before he dies so who cares but no i think i think we we inadvertently stumbled upon a great well a good double feature with lots of similarities and commonalities you know since emmanuel and super dragon versus superman this is the least exciting pairing in terms of neither movies are really they're not box office right Mm -hmm. you know this this episode no one will listen to this episode let's be honest but um, (laughs) if you made it this far thank you but yeah i i was pleasantly surprised with both films and especially with puppet master 2 for sure way better than i remembered it was great movie everybody should go out and watch it so on that note you know what else everybody should do is go check out our patreon where we have monthly commentary tracks sometimes more than one a month and 
check out our YouTube channel where if some of these episodes are too long for you, I get it. We do shorter clips as well as full episodes go on there. Yeah, definitely check out the YouTube channel. Patrick's putting a lot of work into making these shorts and he showed me a list of like, I don't even know how many, a couple hundred shorts that he has scheduled to come out and they're all great. I'm loving we've all got, of them. We've got almost daily releases like through May or something like that. There's there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and I'll, and I'll be honest too, because you cherry picked some really good stuff. Like you got, uh, you've got lots of like genuinely good opinions and uh, guests speaking a lot. Uh, there's lots of me saying nonsense and laughing at something that you're saying that's interesting and intelligent. That's a recurring theme, yes. Yeah, e- every episode. But yeah, check out the YouTube channel. Here's what we've got going on next week. We have National Lampoon's Animal House, the John Landis classic (laughs) film in which no children were harmed during the making of and we've got (laughs) repo man starring the great emilio estevez and harry dean stanton the cult classic from 1984 so that's what we've got going on next week jim and i will return and we hope to see you then